Hello Dynatrace app developers and welcome back to another episode here at Dynatrace apps. Today we are very lucky because we are joined by Miguel Hassan who is joining us from the data visualizations team and we're going to look a little bit more into data visualizations here at Dynatrace. So Mick, thank you for joining us. So before we get started, I'd like to learn a little bit about you and what you're doing at Dynatrace. Sure. So I'm a senior product manager here at Dynatrace. Um, like you mentioned, my responsibility is data visualization. So that effectively means all charts and tables within the Dynatrace platform. Um, I'm also collaborating very closely with all of our app teams, especially in dashboards and notebooks uh, that utilize our data visualizations. Um, and actually, my background is in design. So actually, the topic of data visualization was quite a natural fit for me in the product management realm. So to start us off, why don't you actually explain to us a little bit more about data visualizations? Absolutely. So here at Dynatrace, data is key to what we do. It's the foundation of all our features, our functionality, um, automation, and artificial intelligence. So it really underlies everything we do here at Dynatrace. That being said, systems, programs, algorithms, um, artificial intelligence are suited and love raw data. So they can function in that world um, and it really, really suits them quite well. On the other hand, when you look at someone, look at our human users and us as humans, finding the needle in the haystack, so to say, is really difficult with the raw data. And that's where data visualizations come in. I actually prepared a short little demo I can show you oh, and cool. we can run through it together. Yeah, let's take a look at it. Okay, so if we have a look here, um, so I prepared just a quick query over here, um, and this shows a distribution of failed payments uh, split by credit card provider. Um, so if we start out here, we've got the raw response uh, showing ranges of start and end values with the count of failed, um, failed payments. So this one over here you can see is American Express, 20 failed payments between the 100 and 200 range. And as you go through here, yes, you might see some insights, but it's very difficult to identify any patterns or mm -hmm. you know, trends or trajectories there. So if we scroll down here, I've put the same data set into a table. This is much more visible to see things, right? But also still not ideal. So yes, mm -hmm. we can get some uh, insights here. So I can see the start and the end formatted quite nicely. I can see the, the credit card providers. What I can do is I can sort the data. So that's quite useful. So I can see here, oh, 58 uh, failed uh, payments that are in the 900 to 950 range mm -hmm. for Visa. However, if we look at a simple data visualization, this is a histogram chart. Um, you can s immediately identify spikes in the data. Um, you can identify patterns. You can see some interesting things ha that are happening around here in the $2,000 range. Um, and it's, it's a lot easier and quicker for you to scan the data, to get insights very quickly, and then to take uh, additional steps and actions based on that. Absolutely. I would agree with that. This is way easier to consume. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's interesting that you've shown me this histogram. So perhaps you can share with me a little bit more about the histograms and different other bar charts. Absolutely. So the histogram is quite an interesting chart, but maybe let's take a step back. Um, so at Dynatrace, um, in dashboards and notebooks, we have three different bar charts at the moment. Mm -hmm. The first bar chart um, is a categorical bar chart. It's one that most people are familiar with in their day-to-day -day lives. It's, um, you'll see them in newspapers, um, in Excel, in PowerPoints. They're used all the time. So basically what we have along the, the x-axis here is different categories. These are distinct categories from one another. Um, in this example, I've got uh, sale, uh, departments in a company, so R&D, sales, marketing. And on the y-axis, we have a value in US dollars, just for the sake of this example. If we take a look at a time series bar chart, um, this is very common in the observability industry. Mm -hmm. um, the difference here is that the, the x-axis is now a continuous axis. There are no distinct oh. categories here. Um, so this one, for example, starts just before 4 a.m. and ends at um, just around 6.30. And you can see that there's no breaks in the data, uh, no breaks in the bars, there, there are no gaps in the bars. And that's something that actually is quite uh, confusing for some people that might ask, why don't I see these gaps? Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is because this is a continuous axis. Yep. Um, also, there's a semantic meaning here uh, in the bar chart where the width of this bar um, directly correlates to a duration along the x-axis. So if I hover on this bar here and I pin the tooltip, you can see that this bar has a duration of five minutes. It starts at 5.10 and it ends at 5.15. And in that bucket or in that time frame, um, this host that we have here has an average CPU usage of 21.2%. 
So it's, it's quite distinctly different from the, the categorical bar chart, mm -hmm. which has distinct categories uh, versus this continuous time axis. Now, where things get perhaps even a little bit more confusing for people is when it comes to the histogram. So the histogram, um, similar to the time series bar chart, has a, a continuous axis. However, the continuous axis is numerical in, in nature. So instead of timestamps uh, along the x-axis, we have numbers. So in this use case, in this example here, um, the values run from 0 to 11. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the data here, in a similar way again to the time series, show the bucket sizes. So you can see the bucket size is 0 0.5 in this example with a range from 3 to 3.5. Okay. Uh, and the y-axis is showing frequency. So in a histogram, you can only ha really have a count or a frequency on the y-axis. And that is a count for the number of events or the number of items with, which, uh, within each of these buckets. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can share with us some of the use cases that this graphs could be used for. Absolutely. So if we take a look at this other um, notebook that I prepared, I started with the example that I showed you right in the beginning when we, when we spoke about um, identifying patterns in raw data. Mm -hmm. So this is a distribution of failed payments, um, so it's failed payment events, that has been split by credit card provider. So on the y-axis, I've got the frequency or count that I've just explained. Uh, and along the x-axis, I've got values or continuous axis, a numerical axis, in US dollar amounts. So you can have a look at this chart and you can see, okay, this, these two taller spikes here, um, they have a, a bucket size of 100 US dollars in the 900 to 1000 US dollar range. And the coloring here that you can hover on the legend showcases the different credit card providers. Now what you can do is you can take the same data set and put it also again into a histogram, but split it differently in order to get different insights. So the second example I've prepared here is the distribution of failed payments again. However, this time split by browser. And what's quite interesting is that in the browsers here, we see the majority of these failed payment events are from the Chrome browser. So not only can we identify patterns and see maybe there's an issue with a certain order size that keeps on failing, but we can also identify okay, it's only Chrome browsers that are having this issue or only Microsoft Edge browsers. Also, we don't see any Safari here or any other browsers here. So that can already provide you some insights. As an additional example, um, we can take a look at a bit more um, interesting items such as security events. So over here, I've got the distribution of security event vulnerability scores. Mm -hmm. So this is a scale from 0 to 10. And we can see here that it's almost almost a normal distribution where the, you know, on, the, on either ends of the histogram, we've got lower amounts um, of events. So on the uh, nine to nine and a half uh, severity score range and then nine and a half to 10 range, there are fewer events, but you still might want to prioritize these before the rest of the ones to the left hand side. Um, but very quickly, you can see the patterns within this data set um, that can be otherwise quite abstract. Um, in a, as an Another example, and this one is very frequently used um, in the observability space, is the distribution uh, of span duration. Mm -hmm. So on the y-axis here, we've got count and frequency again. And this is where a lot of people get confused, is we have on the x-axis not time, it's another time series chart, but we have duration, which is a numerical, a continuous numerical axis. However, it's a measure of time, and then that's why people tend to think about it as a time series axis. So over here, you can see uh, it's a left skewed um, distribution where the majority of spans are, are sitting in this uh, zero to 500 millisecond range. However, down here, we've got some that are just under four seconds, so three and a half to four seconds, and another one over here, four and a half to five seconds. So maybe this is something we need to take a look at, uh, why these spans are taking so long. And the last example I prepared here is very similar to the previous one in terms of the setup in term, uh, X axis having duration and Y axis having frequency. And this, however, this time it is the distribution of Davis problem duration. And again, you can see the majority of problems are resolved in under 15 minutes. And as we go um, into the longer durations, uh, into the one hour, two hour, three hour mark, um, you have less and less um, problems being resolved in that time frame. If you had a big spike here, let's say, for example, in a 20 hour time frame, that's maybe something you want to investigate and mm. understand why are those problems taking so long to be resolved. Yeah, this makes sense. So it's so much easier to see where the outliers are in all of these different graphs. Absolutely, absolutely. 
So another uh, data visualization that kind of piques my curiosity is the honeycomb, because it looks so pretty, but I actually want to know what it does. Um, it's a very, very popular visualization, and it actually has become almost a de facto or quasi-standard in, uh, in the industry. So the honeycomb is actually quite interesting because it's an accessless uh, visualization. So the ones we looked at earlier, whether it be the categorical bar chart, the time series bar chart, or even the histogram, they're all what we call XY charts. So they have mm -hmm. an X-axis and a Y-axis. So in this case, we're looking at an accessless visualization. Um, and in particular, the honeycomb is suited for very large data sets and very high level overviews of certain data um, within an environment. So one of the classic use cases is infrastructure monitoring. So in this example I've prepared here, we've got host CPU usage, mm -hmm. and it allows you to very quickly pin pot hot, uh, pinpoint hotspots within your environment. So if, for example, each of the, the tiles, or what we refer to as cells, mm -hmm. in the honeycomb here represent the host with the CPU usage, and quite easily you can identify the, the, the hotspot, so to speak, so, or the, yeah. the high CPU usage within the environment. So you don't need too much background knowledge to understand, okay, well, I need to maybe have a look at the red items within, sure. this, within this honeycomb. So as I mentioned, um, the, the visualization is very, very much suited for infrastructure monitoring, mm -hmm. but I don't want to focus on, only on infrastructure monitoring because it's a very versatile visualization. Sure. So as an example, we can also look at the number of problems per entity, for example. Okay. So in each of these cells um, in the honeycomb, we're representing, again, um, entities, so in this case, hosts. But this time, we're visualizing the number of open Davis problems for each of those hosts in the environment. You'd also notice that I've changed the, the shape here. So we actually support three different shapes, um, the traditional hexagon, mm -hmm. the square or the tile, as well as circles, um, as you'll see in this next example. So this example here showcases security vulnerability scores. So it's quite similar to the example I showed you in the, in the hist histogram for the distribution. Um, but this time, we got an overview of all the security problems in this particular environment. Um, and it's showcasing the different security scores. So over here, you can see these, these, these open problems here have a high security score that maybe yeah. needs to be investigated further. Cool. So if this all went red, this would be a big problem. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in the office on that day. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So what we've done here is we've basically looked at everything in numerical values. Mm -hmm. Is there any other way that we can have a look at this? Yes, and that's actually a fantastic question because very often people think about um, values as being numerical in nature. It's, I think it's, it's a very um, a co a common perception that you know, whether it be kilobytes, US dollars, mm -hmm. um, CPU usage, it's all numerical in nature. However, values can also be strings. So in this example, I've taken security vulnerabilities, but now looked at their status. Um, and I've also plotted that on the honeycomb. Um, and you'll see over here, we've got open, um, open vulnerabilities, resolved uh, vulnerabilities, muted and covered, all displayed again within the honeycomb. Um, as another example, I've taken uh, Davis problem events mm -hmm. uh, and also mapped their um, statuses onto the honeycomb. And again, here you can see all the gray ones are closed, so those have been resolved, life is good. Um, uh, however, the ones on the top here are all active. So maybe that's something you want to hone in on and, and dive a bit deeper into understanding why do we have all these open um, Davis problems in this environment. But you can see very quickly that um, in all these examples, they allow you this 30,000 foot view. Yep. They're perfect for dashboarding use cases um, to showcase a lot of data at a glance, and then you can use that as like a a jumping board or springboard, actually, um, for further investigation and remediation. Makes sense. Using that to drill down further into the data. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So given now that we've taken a look at all the data visualization components that we potentially have, mm -hmm. one thing that I'm interested to learn about is actually how do we build our data visualizations here at Dynatrace? Yeah, that, that's a super interesting question. So. With all of our visualization components, and as you've seen, we, we have taken a look at two of them. We have quite a few more. Um, we start by taking a look at what we did in the previous Dynatrace. So mm -hmm. what did we do in the Barista design system? Um, what were the pain points? What are the limitations? And what do we want to improve in the Strata design system? Um, at the same time, we also have um, a lot of discussions with all the various internal teams that have mm -hmm. domain knowledge and do domain expertise because ultimately they will be using our visualizations for their use cases. At the same time, um, we want to take that knowledge and we want to combine it with 
what are other design systems doing in a more generic nature, right? So they don't have the necessary observability focus that we do, but it's still interesting to see what are people doing in the industry from a data visualization standpoint. And then what we do is we take those very specific domain requirements of the teams in Dynatrace, mm -hmm. we take a look at what, like I mentioned, what other design systems are doing, and we bring those together and try and find the balance between flexibility, what's suitable for, for the Dynatrace platform, what's suitable for Strato, and that kind of sets the foundation for what we will build uh, for a particular component, for a particular visualization. Okay, that's really interesting. And that sort of leads me to my next question, which is why? Why should people be using our data visualizations mm -hmm. within their Dynatrace apps? Yeah, that's, I, th I think, a really good question. So one of the major benefits you, you as a developer get by utilizing the Dynatrace visualizations, or the Strata visualizations, I should say, so you don't have to worry about compatibility um, or maintenance of the components yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So that's everything we take care of. Um, but I think actually what's even more important is that the visualizations that we've just taken a look at uh, and that are available in the Strata design system are the exact same visualization that our teams use that also um, are available to partners and customers. So what this means is that um, by utilizing the Dynatrace Strata visualizations in mm -hmm. your apps, you create the seamless experience and you reduce the cognitive load that your end users have to have when switching between apps, whether it be a Dynatrace app, a partner app, or a customer app. Um, I think our users have enough to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis that they don't have to, again, when they switch between apps, have to re-understand what's going on, what am I looking at, what, how do I interact with this chart, when they just know because of interacting with other apps what they're doing. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in, in our process, um, when designing and building Strato uh, data visualization um, components, we consider the Dynatrace platform and the industry um, throughout the process. So mm -hmm. they really are tailored to what we're doing and what we what we're doing at Dynatrace, mm -hmm. uh, rather than something extremely generic that doesn't have our domain knowledge or our domain expertise built into them. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's nice to see that we sort of think about it as a holistic sort of view in terms of no matter where you are, you're going to sort of see the same. So it's easier for you to consume mm -hmm. as a yeah. user. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, as an external now, uh, perhaps I want to go I've watched this video and I've gone, hey, I want to go and use mm -hmm. some of these data visualizations. Where should I go? Yeah, your definite, your first point of course should be the Dynatrace developer. Yep. Um, have a look through there, we've documented everything. Um, that's also where our teams go. So again, everything that we have in terms of documentation internally, we put on the Dynatrace developer for external, to, um, external developers to utilize. Um, I would also say is, take a look at the apps that Dynatrace provides, mm -hmm. um, see how they're utilizing the visualizations. I know whatever they are achieving there, you can also achieve on your own, in your own custom apps um, for your use cases. And that might give you some inspiration to see how you can utilize the visualizations for your specific use cases. That's a great top tip. And actually, I have another top tip. If you have any questions whilst going mm -hmm. through these data visualizations, you can go and use the Dynatrace community, which we have a developers forum there, mm -hmm. where you can go in and ask any questions, and you can get responses even from our developers or from the general community there. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's all for today. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to Mick here for joining us and giving us a little bit more information on data visualizations. Don't forget to give a like or a subscribe to this video if you've enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.